welcome to today's topical workshop. Um, while we wait for um, everyone to file in, please get settled and we will start promptly at 3.01. We're expecting a lot of people here today, so. Welcome everyone who has joined. We're gonna wait about a minute uh, for attendees to file in. Please get settled uh, while we wait um, a minute or so, a couple of minutes. Our numbers are growing. Welcome everyone uh, to today's topical workshop. We will be starting in about a minute while we wait for more participants to join us. We're expecting uh, a large crowd today. Hey, I think we're going to get started. Um, welcome to the second topical workshop related to advancing 30 by 30 and climate smart lands. Today, we will focus on using nature-based solutions to advance equity. And we'll feature an advisory panel presentation followed by an, uh, a public input opportunity. My name is Cece Vu and I will be facilitating today's meeting. Uh, we wanna start with a few housekeeping items. This workshop will be recorded for further viewing and will be posted on the website. And for phone users, it's www.californianature.ca.gov. We are also streaming this workshop live on the CNRA YouTube page. This meeting is being interpreted in Spanish. And in order to access the audio channel for Spanish, please click the interpretation button, the globe icon in the Zoom taskbar at the bottom. The button will appear after these instructions. These instructions will be repeated in Spanish and then you will be able to join the Spanish language audio channel. We will now invite our interpreter, Victor Hernandez, to repeat these instructions in Spanish. Victor. Thank you, Cici. Eh, muy buenas tardes. Eh, le queremos dejar saber a todos ustedes que esta reunión será interpretada al español. 
para poder acceder lo que es el canal de audio, usted tendrá que hacer clic en el botón de interpretación, que será un icono del globo, es decir, un, un icono de mundo que aparecerá en la barra de tareas de esta plataforma de Zoom. Después va a aparecer un menú y entonces usted podrá seleccionar el idioma. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Cici. Thank you, Victor. We now invite participants to join the interpretation audio channel. Please click the interpretation button, the globe icon in the Zoom taskbar at the bottom. If you need closed captioning, please click the closed caption icon in the Zoom taskbar and then select subtitles to view subtitles on the screen or live transcript to see the full transcript on the side panel. Participants will be muted and off video for the duration of the meeting. During the public input portion of the workshop, you will be able to go off mute to speak. If you need technical assistance, please use the chat function on the Zoom taskbar. We, this, we're reserving this only for technical assistance. If you're on the phone, please dial star nine. We will also share relevant links through the chat feature throughout the meeting. During the panel presentation, you may use the Q&A function to send typed questions. The advisory panel will address a few clarifying questions, for instance, things you don't understand or hear at the end of their presentation. We have a large number of members participating today, about 200 participants right now. So we invite you to please follow these guidelines for a productive meeting. Please be respectful to each other and to the workshop agenda and objectives. Threatening, profane, or other inappropriate language is not allowed. Disruptive participants will be removed from the workshop. My colleague, Debbie Schechter, will be co-facilitating the public input portion of the workshop. And joining us from California Natural Resources Agency are Amanda Hansen, Deputy Secretary for Climate Change, and Jennifer Norris, Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity and Habitat. Today's objectives are to explore opportunities to promote equity and access through conservation and climate smart land strategies. Present advisory panel findings and recommendations and hear from you about your priorities for addressing climate change. We have inserted a link in the chat to an agenda that you can follow for today's workshop. And it's also on the screen. We will hear brief updates related to Pathways to 30 by 30 and Natural Working Lands Climate Smart Strategy. We will receive a presentation from the advisory panel, followed by a brief clarifying Q&A session. After that, we will take a short break and then begin, begin hearing public input. Now over to you, Amanda. Thank you, Cece, and thanks to everyone for being here tonight. We're thrilled to have you and um, to get this conversation started so that we can be sure it is integrated moving forward. As Cece mentioned, my name is Amanda Hansen, and I'm the Deputy Secretary for Climate Change at the Natural Resources Agency. I'm gonna provide some background on the governor's executive order on nature-based solutions and the natural and working lands climate smart strategy. My colleague, Jen, will talk about pathways to 30 by 30. In October of 2020, Governor Newsom issued executive order N8220 which called for greater use of nature-based solutions to address the crises of climate change and biodiversity loss. Among other actions, the executive order committed California to conserving 30% of our lands and coastal waters by 2030 and enlisting California's vast network of natural and working lands, forests, 
rangelands, farms, wetlands, deserts, urban green spaces, and more in the fight against climate change. The Resources Agency, in partnership with other agencies across the state, are developing two strategies to inform these efforts. Pathways to 30 by 30 and the Natural and Working Lands Climate Smart Strategy. Natural and Working Lands is the term California uses to describe the nature-based solutions sector to address climate change. And our lands offer significant opportunity to meet California's climate change goals, both achieving carbon neutrality and building climate resilience. They are not fully utilized in our state's climate agenda and the Natural and Working Lands Climate Smart Strategy is intended to close this gap. We are excited to align relevant existing state efforts under one cohesive strategy and identify climate smart land management actions that help us protect vulnerable communities, achieve carbon neutrality, improve public health and safety, and expand economic opportunity. We will be releasing a draft of the Natural and Working Lands Climate Smart Strategy for public review and comment this summer so that we can finalize it in the fall. I want to thank everyone for the insights and inputs already provided to inform the development of this strategy. And I look forward to hearing more today. Over to Jen, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you all for being here today. I too am really excited about this panel. We conceived of it a long time and I'm just so thrilled to have this group here and, and to hear from all of you. So as Amanda mentioned, the governor's nature-based solution executive order underscores California's commitment to protect our unique biodiversity and leverage actions from the environment to reduce the harmful effects of climate change. One of the key goals of this effort is California's commitment to conserve 30% of our lands and coastal waters by 2030. This so-called 30 by 30 pledge is part of a global movement to protect our natural world by protecting the ocean and lands. In California, we are working to conserve 30 by 30 in a manner that protects biodiversity, combats climate change, increases access to nature while safeguarding our economic sustainability and our food supply. Our strategy to achieve 30 by 30 will be presented in our Pathways to 30 by 30 document, which is due in February, 2022. This document will identify challenges, opportunities, and strategies to achieve 30 by 30. It will set us on the path to successful implementation a draft of this document will be released in the fall for your feedback. We are also developing CA Nature, a geospatial information system. This will be a publicly accessible suite of interactive mapping and visualization tools that we can all use to identify places across California where we will have the opportunity to achieve our biodiversity, climate, and equity goals. Central to all of this work, has been public participation. It is truly key to the development of the Climate Smart Land Strategy, the Pathways to 30 by 30 document, and CA Nature. We can't do this without your input and expertise. CC is going to talk more about opportunities to be engaged in this important work. Thanks again for being here. We look forward to the panel presentation and from hearing from you. Now back to CC. Thank you, Jen. Today's topical workshop builds on several previous public engagement milestones. Uh, next slide, please. Formal consultation with California Native American tribes and continued tri tribal engagement activities. Ongoing engagement with priority communities and stakeholders. 
nine regional workshops engaging 2,500 stakeholders across California, and several topical workshops aimed at to address key topics and questions and gather your input. We're looking for specific ideas on types of programs that should be included or expanded on, referrals to any organizations doing relevant work to propel us closer to the goals of 30 by 30 and advancing nature-based solutions. We wanna hear from you as, as many participants as possible. And so we'll um, have 90 seconds to uh, to provide your input. If you don't get a chance to speak today, you want to provide additional input, you may send an email to californianature at resources.ca.gov, send a letter via postal mail here, or leave a voicemail message at 1-800-417-0668. We are also requesting participants consider to consider how you would address the questions posed to today's advisory panelists and provide input within one week. Now back to Jen for an overview of the topical advisory panel. Thanks, Cece. So I just want to note at the top that we know 90 seconds to speak on any of these topics really isn't enough. We know that. And we also know that a lot of people want to weigh in out loud. So we are doing our best to accommodate as many people as possible. But please do take advantage of the opportunity to share more substantive comments in writing. And no, we hope we can work toward in-person discussions someday soon. In the meantime, we hope you will continue to meet us here in the Zoom world and make this as good as it can be. So the purpose of the topical advisory panels is to address key topics and questions to support the development of the Pathways to 30 by 30 document and the Natural and Working Lands Climate Smart Strategy, as well as CA Nature. Each advisory panel will be producing a summary document that most of you should have seen on the web a week ago that gives context to their topic area, offers technical or other insights, and provides key recommendations. And we know we could have chosen so many different people for these panels. There is tremendous expertise across the state on conservation related issues. So we're also asking the public to provide their perspectives and insights on the topics and on the key questions being asked of the panel. We're really interested in the full range of insight from all of you, as well as the panel we've assembled here today. So topical panels, uh, we have five um, on five topics. The first was climate action. Last week, we heard from the panel and public on opportunities to address climate change and how, and how best to deliver on the state's goal to achieve carbon neutrality and build climate resilience. Today, we will explore opportunities for the state to advance and promote equity and access through its conservation and climate smart strategies. We will also convene panels to a panel to discuss how best to use 30 by 30 to protect biodiversity. That's now scheduled for July 27th. And finally, we will have two other workshops that will explore what we mean when we say conserve lands or conserve coastal waters. These workshops will dive into how we are defining these terms and what counts. They're not yet scheduled, but we are shooting for early August. So we often get asked how the members were selected to be on each panel. So we invited the participation of credible, independent individuals with experience or expertise on the relevant topic to serve on these panels. We also worked hard to represent a diversity of perspectives, backgrounds, and experience, including geographies. We sought academic and research experience and also practitioners with on the ground expertise. Critically important, we looked for panelists who could represent a broad array of issues in their fields and not be advocates for a particular position or point of view. We did not try to set these up as a battle of stakeholders at all. Really, this is intended to be a synthesis of the topic and a conversation starter. Finally, we chose our moderators based on their ability to foster a broad, inclusive dialogue 
that welcomes diverse views. We will be releasing information soon about the Biodiversity Advisory Panel, so stay tuned. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Amanda to introduce today's panel. Thank you, Jen. We asked the advisory panel and you members of the public to address several questions related to the nexus between equity, climate change, and biodiversity. The specific questions can be found on the project website, which is being linked in the chat. Using the questions and their expertise, the advisory panel collaborated to distill current knowledge available, highlight gaps and needs, and develop recommendations to inform the state's approach to achieving 30 by 30 and developing our climate smart land strategy. These reflections and recommendations were incorporated into the summary Jen just mentioned that was released last week. And in a moment, we will get to hear from the panel member members themselves on these topics. Really excited to also hear from the public after the advisory panel session concludes on how you would address and answer these same questions. So please join me in welcoming the members of our advisory panel. I'll start with Guillermo Rodriguez, who is the panel moderator and California State Director for the Trust for Public Land. Sandra Celedon is the President and CEO of Fresno Building Healthy Communities. Beth Rose Middleton Manning is the Professor and Chair of the Department of Native American Studies at the University of California, Davis. Marie Walker, is Chief Operating Officer at the CORE Network. Alvaro Sanchez is Vice President of Policy at the Greenlining Institute. And Chris Schell is Assistant Professor in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management at the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome all of you. Thank you very much for being here today and for your time. And now Guillermo, over to you to lead the panel presentation. Thank you, uh, Amanda and uh, Jen, uh, and to the staff of the California Natural Resources Agency for uh, the tremendous work you put into organizing this panel and this conversation. I just wanted to thank uh, my fellow panelists, uh, the opportunity to, to join you in this conversation uh, around centering equity in California's um, strategy around implementing 30 by 30 and uh, advising the state on centering equity as part of climate smart lands, I think is super critical. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, trying to figure this question out. And so the document that has been released to the public really only scratches at the surface of how equity should be centered in the work around natural climate solutions in California. And it represents just a collective idea, um, at just really the tip of it all for the work that's engaged. We panelists uh, are all looking forward to hearing the tremendous ideas that exist um, um, in the public around this issue. And so with that, why don't we just jump in? Um, our panelists decided instead of trying to address each question, um, we thought that was too linear, but to really, at, we asked them each to kind of present the highlights of some of the ideas and thoughts and perspectives that were part of the presentation and the document that we released out to the public. And so with that, I'm gonna invite um, Alvaro Sanchez with the Greenlining Institute uh, to kick us off uh, with his perspective. Alvaro. Yeah, Director Guillermo, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alvaro Sanchez. I'm the Vice President of Policy at the Greenlining Institute. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Really honored to be uh, a member of this panel for this important conversation. Um, really what I wanna contribute here is the idea that equity is not just a commitment that we have in this work, but it really has to be a practice. And I think that that's really gonna be the challenge for the 30 by 30 initiative and executive order is how do we practice equity in the way that we are articulating our strategy 
in the documents that are still to be put together and that will go through public review and will ultimately be the backbone of what we do moving forward for this work. And what I mean by equity being not just a commitment, but a practice is really meaning getting into the details about what equity means in our execution of this executive order. So it's clear that um, you know, within the last year, because of everything that we've experienced, that the word equity has become more synonymous and more uh, is something that everybody is using uh, much more freely, which is great. I think it's great to know that people are committing to an equity approach. But now we really have to do the hard work, which means we, not, we need to put some details behind that approach. How does it reflect in our procedural equity and process for coming up with what we want to do in implementing 30 by 30? What does implementation with an equity lens look like? And how do we measure for equity success, not just using data, but the lived experiences of those who have traditionally been left out of the conversation in putting this strategy forward? So we are at a critical time and at the best time possible to begin this conversation about equity practice within the confines of the 30 by 30 um, executive order, because we are in the process of putting that foundational document together about what it means to do this with an equity lens. So really that's gonna be the challenge for the work moving forward for us. And I think it's important that we get into those details and articulate what our strategy means. Um, and a best, and a really good way to actually get into the details is to develop standards and practices that we are going to implement moving forward. So in the document, we uh, put together a list of potential um, uh, strategies that uh, really spell out what equity is. How can we in include anti-racist strategies in the way that we're going to go about doing this work? How, what does that mean for us? How do we create wealth building opportunities in the implementation of a 30 by 30 strategy and create new economic opportunities that are friendly to the planet, but also helping people that don't have economic opportunities currently participate in a new regenerative economy? How do we make sure that we are addressing multiple needs? We are about to experience a severe heat spike. How do we make sure that as we move forward to try to mitigate the impact, we're not just creating a way to alleviate the heat uh, exposure that people are gonna be experiencing, but also creating other opportunities like healthy environments where people to recreate and be able to enjoy the outdoors. This is gonna be the challenge for us, but I'm looking forward to working with you all in making sure that we make equity real through the implementation of this strategy. So I'll hand it over back to you, Guillermo. Thank you, Alvaro, really appreciate that. And just a reminder to all of our, our panelists, since we're doing a simultaneous translation to slow our, our speed down um, as we're presenting. And so with that, I'm gonna ask uh, Professor Middleton Manning if uh, you would go next and, and share with us um, your thoughts and perspectives based on, on the work we've collectively done. Yes, I would like to emphasize being attentive to the context in which we are working, in which we are developing this 30 by 30 strategy. In terms of thinking, thinking through the injustices that have taken place to develop you know, the, the categories of landscapes that we have so that we don't reproduce these injustices in our current planning efforts and partnerships. So as many of you know, the California context is one of three successive waves of colonization impacting indigenous nations throughout California. Uh, and the, the last of those waves being the, uh, the American period. And the land claims process even outside of conservation made it such that uh, there are claims to water and land that are old in today's standards, but were not accessible to uh, non-white males at the time. So there's an entrenched history of dispossession here to think about, and there's a context of conservation that involves um, exclusion, sort of closing off lands from access, especially culturally important lands to indigenous nations. Uh, we also talked broadly about you know, lack of opportunity and dispossession of people from other backgrounds, African-American, Asian, Latinx in California. And so we don't want to reproduce those inequalities and that lack of access in this conservation planning. And I think we have some opportunities here to both assess some of the, the impacts that are extant on the landscape today. Um, for example, much of my work is about water projects and the ways in which they dispossessed people, impacted ecology, impact fisheries, et cetera. Um, 
And we have an opportunity today to try to address some of those impacts, perhaps through co-management with Indigenous nations, perhaps through land transfers, perhaps through some just really innovative thinking about who takes care of lands and for what purposes, uh, and thinking not only about ecosystem services that benefit humans, but also to, to draw on and point to the work of Bill Tripp, who's Karuk Natural Resources Director, the ways human beings can benefit uh, ecosystems through land stewardship and care. And I would emphasize, and we spoke about this on the panel, uh, foregrounding indigenous leadership in implementing traditional ecological knowledge on landscapes to ensure both climate smart strategies, but also climate smart strategies that, that foreground equity and addressing some of the entrenched injustices that exist within our system. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for, for your comments. And moving over to uh, Marie Walker, uh, Marie. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marie Walker, and I am the non-California person on this panel. I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C. And yes, the cicadas are just as bad as you see on TV. Um, but I represent the uh, Core Network, which is the National Association of Service and Conservation Corps. And we work with approximately 25,000 young people across the, the country doing a wide variety of green jobs. Uh, and out of that 25,000 from across the country, about 6,000 of those young people come from the state of California. Um, they work on different projects such as weatherization and retrofitting of, of housing. Uh, they have, the young people have done approximately um, 1 million tons of recycling uh, that's been collected. Uh, five thousand uh, waterways have been restored. So there's a wide variety of jobs and work that the young people have done. They, these young people come to the, the cores and their communities uh, with a wide variety of needs. Some of them come and they, they don't have a high school diploma or GED. Some come and they're college graduates. So they all work together for one common cause, one common goal. And my what I would say is that what advice I would give to um, other organizations that would like to, to start this work, I'd probably give you three things. The first one is start where you are. You've got to prioritize the funding. Funding for so many has been misused and, and funding has been kind of thrown at communities without any type of prioritization. So I would say in starting where you are, prioritize your funding. Second, I would say use what you have. Training has to be fair. When you're looking at workforce development uh, throughout your communities, the training has to be fair. There has to be a, a, a level playing field so that everyone who becomes involved is involved at the same level. Now, everybody doesn't come with the same knowledge and, and the same skills and the same education, but at the least we can do when we're looking at uh, natural resources and we're looking at public lands, we can make that available, that training available, that's fair to everyone that's involved. And the third thing that I'd like to say is do what you can. There has to be commitment to, uh, to the community. So many people in communities uh, of color, people that look like me, don't always have the same opportunities because there's not that uh, commitment to, um, to practicing equity. We've got to make sure that equity is practiced fairly and that there is commitment. And as uh, uh, Mr. Sanchez has said, we have to go beyond commitment and what goes beyond commitment, I think, is passion. We have to be passionate about the people that we work with. We can do this. We don't have any other choice, but I, I think, but to work together. But, but I, I would like to, to close in saying that I, this has been an honor for me to be on this panel and to, to have, I've learned a lot. Hopefully I've been able to share some of the things 
uh, with some of my, my fellow uh, panelists, but this has been a tremendous opportunity. And don't believe all those crazy things that you hear about Washington, DC. There's still some good folks here. Thank you, Marie. I appreciate uh, your comments and, and your participation on the panel and, and your contributions. Shifting over now to um, Sandra um, and, and our great Central Valley to, to give us uh, your perspective. Thank you, Guillermo. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, very, very happy to be here today and um, definitely echo the comments that, that have been made by my colleagues before me. And I, I really wanna center the, the conversation on community and really thinking about that equity is about starting with people. And that ultimately the goal um, of 30 by 30 and the goal of, of I'm, I'm assuming most of or all of the folks on this call is to have real outcomes for people, right? And so we really need to make sure that we start where people are. And very oftentimes um, that means that we have to invest in building organizational capacity. We have to invest in building people power and we have to invest in younger generations. And I think that that's really important specifically for places like the Central Valley where the vast majority of our constituents or residents are under the age of 30. We're a very young right, community, just like communities across the state. And so one of the ways that we've engaged community um, specifically in, in land use. And it really didn't start with parks to be quite frank, right? We were having a conversation about, you know, other, other um, types of land use in terms of development and community, housing opportunity and so forth. And it was young people, 13 and 14 year olds that elevated the importance of parks for Fresno building healthy communities and actually called us to talk about parks more explicitly and address their concerns with not just the lack of, um, of healthy spaces in their community, right? But also the quality when there is an open space. And I think for most folks across communities, when we think about land use or when we think about outdoor spaces, the vast majority of folks will engage in an outdoor setting in their neighborhood or they won't engage at all, right, for communities. And we know that communities of color lack access to usable green um, and outdoor space, right? This is where we build on and add to capacity to extend to regional, state, and other, um, other spaces. And so, for example, in, at Fre in Fresno, the conversations that we've centered with young folks has, has really been focusing on creating opportunities for employment within the green sector, within parks, right? Creating opportunities to build social connections and social cohesion, leveraging the community culture that's already present, right? The assets that are already in our community, and then building on organizational capacity of not just nonprofit organizations, but even community groups. For example, I remember very vividly Friends of Kawa, which at that point was just a bunch of neighbors getting together and talking about how do we improve our community so that we're not overtaken by heavy industry and we actually invest in our regional park space. And it was through this conversation, right, through this neighborhood group that eventually incorporated that we built enough capacity to 10 years later be able to go after Prop 68 funds, right, to renovate Cowell Park. And so community capacity is really about having this, this long-term investment in working alongside community. And very often times it doesn't feel like it's the goal is moving forward, right? Because we build, right? We move at the, at the pace of trust. And I think when we talk about equity, we also have to be prepared to have really challenging conversations to acknowledge the pain and the hurt that it is within community because of the lack of access, the lack of investment, and more importantly, the lack of inclusion. It's really important that as we talk about engagement, we're not just talking about inviting folks to a meeting, Right, but that we're actually inviting folks to a conversation. And if we're inviting folks to a conversation, then what folks share with us needs to be reflected in not just the policy, but also the implementation. And this goes to kind of my final point, which is about the intent must match the outcome, right? Great intentions are wonderful, but great outcomes are better. And so again, it goes back to how do we make sure that there's real results for people in community and that we really are looking at not just 
not perpetuating further harm, but also undoing some of the harm that has been caused in the past, whether it's intentional or unintentional. And the way to do that is by focusing on community-based localized efforts that have emphasized engagement that when we start in neighborhood, absolutely uh, grow up to regional and state land practices. And I think this is the best approach as we think about community and practice and absolutely agree with Alvaro that equity is not um, a destination. You don't arrive at equity. It's a continuous practice. It's about ensuring that all people have access to the resources necessary for health, and for success and ultimately for their ability to be able to thrive. And what we're seeing across California is that there's a vast number of Californians that are not able to thrive because they've been locked out of not just access, but also functionality. And so that's really what I wanted to share with you all in center and just say how proud I am of, of being able to, to share um, the experience of young people, really the learnings that young people have shared with us and the talents and those 13 and 14 year olds that asked us to focus on parks are now some of our outdoor champions that are leading right hikes out in the Sierras that are now employed right in the green sector that have gone on to college. Um, and so that capacity, right, we've been building it for, for the last 10 years. And that's ultimately the, the types of outcomes that we want to see, not just in Fresno, but across the state. Thank you, Sandra. Really appreciate that. And also wanted to underscore for, for the collective discussion our panel had um, around equity as not being a destination. Um, one of the things that we were very clear in our conversation is that when you think about equity and natural climate solutions, and even the 30 by 30 initiative, really our biggest uh, recommendation to the state that equity is not a checkbox that is checked on uh, reviewing a grant application. It is not um, just looking at um, how funds are being dispersed and are they being dispersed equitably across the board. We really wanted to underscore that, you know, the context of, of equity and the work that we're doing is very much intertwined in every aspect of the work. It's not a, a nice to have, it's not a percent set aside. It's none of these things. It really is, we're advising the state to be centered and for the state to think about its strategy from that equity lens, first and foremost, to achieve the important climate changes and challenges and address these things from, from that vantage point. So thank you, Sandra, for, for bringing that up and, and reminding uh, us and, and, and the public uh, on, on that question. Shifting over to our, our final panelist uh, to round out the presentations and, and then open it up to some, some Q&A uh, that we'll have together, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Schell if uh, you'd present uh, your thoughts. Yes, absolutely. And I would also like to thank everybody who's come to this panel discussion and workshop, all of my colleagues and other panelists, and for y'all inviting me today to speak with you about my perspectives as an urban ecologist. And as Guillermo had made mention, it should be noted that one of perhaps the most profound things that I took away from this exercise was that equity is the bedrock. We oftentimes are talking about equity perhaps as ancillary or an afterthought, but you'll notice in many of the other workshops that talk about the biology, the ecology, the sustainability of those systems at every single level, equity needs to be the foundation. Now, I'm an urban ecologist who studies coyotes. I watch how animals like birds and bats and mountain lions move through the landscape, right? So I love the cute fuzzy things that really bring us quite a bit of joy. But in that joy, it should be noted that the important piece to take away here is that the word ecology ties us all together. So ecology at its base level is the relationship of organisms to other organisms and organisms to their environment. Why do I define that term? Well, in the document that we brought together, we talk about ecological relationships, but how equity in and of itself is an ecological relationship. And inequity in the system 
essentially defeats all of our purposes from sustainability to conservation to mitigating the climate crisis. If we can't figure out how to build equitable solutions, understanding past ills and creating solutions that put people of color in disenfranchised communities at the forefront of this change, none of the ecological solutions we put together will work. Why do I say that? Let me give you an example. In much of the research I and my colleagues have done, we've taken a look at policies like redlining, which in a nutshell is residential segregation enforced from the 1930s to the 60s that decided who would live where based off of the color of your skin, right? That created these A through D regions, A being for predominantly white Americans that were wealthy and D deemed hazardous by the US government, predominantly black and brown communities. To this day, even though that policy was abolished more than 50 years ago, where the trees are, where the green spaces are, where the habitats are, where the niches are for all of the other organisms to live in are predominantly in those areas that were white and wealthy, many of which are still like that to this day. So I oftentimes, as a black man, but also as an ecologist, see the eyes not only through my own lens, but the lens of the animals that I study. I think about where are most of the resources? How do I get from point A to point B? How do I make sure that my family is eating as well? So then that way my offspring and my offspring's offspring can eat. In all of this, it should be noted that connectivity begets connectivity. So how the landscape is connected, say habitats, green spaces or otherwise, and how they're potentially bifurcated or fragmented because of freeways also influences how healthy our non-human organisms are gonna be as well as our human organisms. So in all of this, it should be noted that as connective as we can be, using equity as our backbone and our bedrock allows for other natural systems to be connected as well. And in all of that, perhaps, and this is my final thought, one of the things that y'all should take away, if you take away nothing else other than coyotes are cute and fuzzy, is this idea that if we can promote equity in our ability to connect with each other, then we can start to connect the state in ways that other states can follow, where they can see that the roadmap is not to only thinking about natural resources and excluding all peoples, but in fact, we are integral in this system. Again, ecology is the interaction of organisms to other organisms and organisms to their environment. And we are said organisms. So to dissolve ourselves away from that equation is misplaced, and will not work. And that is part of the reason why if we want to be successful in the future, we must lead with each other and Michael Jackson look in the mirror, figure out how we change our ways to impact the state in a better way. Thank you, Professor Shell. I, I think uh, for the public uh, listening into the conversation, you could see the, the rich debate um, that we had um, and thinking about equity um, and California's natural uh, climate solutions and, and where that intersection is. I'm gonna ask um, a few of the questions to, to the panel to draw out some of the ideas that are in the document and encourage everyone to, to look at that set of recommendations we pulled together. It's only the beginning and really a lot of your public comment will build on that to really give the state the, the, the ideas um, and direction in order to incorporate into their final two documents that will lead uh, what California does and also encourage folks that are listening in and, and watching this to, to use the Q&A function to ask questions and, and I'll go through those uh, and pose those to the, the group. I'm gonna uh, ask Marie uh, if she would comment a, a little bit more. We spent a lot of time talking about thinking about investments in natural climate solutions when we think of restoration work, if we think about conservation work, and really looking at multiple benefits. How can you know, the state's investment um, you know, in the tens of millions of dollars at times 
in these projects really elicit the kind of benefits that the community needs. We talked about green jobs as being you know, critical to have workforce development, but we also talked about that it isn't just training, it really is career development and paid process. What advice would you give to you know, organizations who are doing major restoration work or doing heavy conservation that are doing this type of work? What does success from a, a, a multiple benefit outcome really look like? Well, I, I think I may have alluded to that in my opening um, uh, comments is that I think you have to look at what the organization has to look at where they are and reach the people where they are. Um, we, we have got to get away from this idea that um, communities of color don't matter. So I think that, that one of the ways that organizations can, can actually make a difference is going into that community. Remember, workforce development is people development. It's taking people and, and giving people what they need in order to be successful. So I think in, in any organization that wants, you know, the, the green jobs are gonna be there. There's going to, to be a, 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 a wide variety of those jobs that will be available. We have to make sure that the people are available and that the people come prepared to be able to do the job. But we cannot, um, I, I really liked what the professor said. We can't look at this as a, uh, 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 an ancillary uh, uh, mode. It has to be the bedrock. It has to be ingrained in us. Equity means equity. And I think when you look at, at other organizations, when, they, when they're looking at developing the green jobs, look at where they are, get the people where they are and get the people what they need. And the people will take it to the next level. You don't have to worry about that. The job will get done. Thank you, Marie. I'm gonna, um, I was gonna ask uh, Alvaro a question. And my question is a lot like uh, one that's in the um, question aspect. So I'll, I'll, I'll revert to the question that was raised um, by a member of the public. Question is usually political will of representatives and within state agency has been a historic, historically significant barrier to advancing equity. What recommendations can overcome these organizational and political barriers um, within the 30 by 30 process? Now, I'll, I'll, I'll punt to you to, to see if you can help us answer that question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think I just need to reinforce this idea of practicing equity. Equity is not just one person's job or assigned to someone to do the work of equity and then we just, we can call it a day. Um, equity really has to be something that we all commit to practicing and that we have the tools to be able to do so. So yes, decision makers and folks who currently have power have not practiced equity because we are operating in an equitable system that's been created and which perpetuated the inequities that we are dealing with today. So to undo those issues, we have to take a systemic response to that. So in fact, Greenlining and a bunch of other organizations are currently proposing that we establish a statewide office of racial equity for California so that California has the tools and the, and the personnel to allow the states to practice equity comprehensively. Um, and I think that this is what's gonna turn the tide. It's not gonna be done in one year or in the next decade. We are working on a multi-century uh, system that has built in inequities, whether it's redlining, whether it's genocide, whether it's slavery, we are dealing with those impacts today. And those things were implemented, not simply by individuals. They were reinforced by policy. They were reinforced by court decisions. And they were sometimes brutally enforced by law enforcement. So to undo all of that, we are going to need to commit to the long-term practice of equity. I'd really like to highlight this piece that Dr. Manuel Pastor from USC recently said, and I really like the, the, the kind of the language around that. We have to have urgency about racial justice 
that we have to have patience with our strategy. And I really love that because it puts those two things in, um, in the same kind of sentence. And it's true. We have to have urgency about dealing with the racial inequities that are really creating adverse circumstances for the most vulnerable people. But we have to give this strategy patience and time to develop because it's gonna take time to undo the systems that are currently getting in our way, including our political system, which has not allowed our decision makers to take the approach to equity that they need to in order to address the challenges of the future. Thank you, Alvaro, appreciate that, um, that perspective. Let me um, bump over to uh, Professor Middleton Manning and, and ask if you would elaborate a little bit more um, Governor Newsom's 30 by 30 executive order specifically calls on state agencies uh, to pursue innovative actions and strategies around healthy soils, forest management, um, and other examples. You know, from your vantage point, what you, know, you shared with, with the panel, you know, many interesting ideas and examples of innovative ways um, for the state to deliver intentional be benefits to indigenous peoples. Can you elaborate a little bit more on some of these examples? Yes, definitely, thank you. Um, one thing I would like to add to that also is just making sure that we are thinking about equity in rural areas in the Sierra Nevadas, in the coast range that are outside of the Central Valley and I think sometimes fall out of state assessments of where inequity is happening. But there is profound uh, disinvestment that has occurred over the last several decades with the decline in the timber industry in rural areas. Uh, and there are, are still high rates of joblessness and disinvestment enfranchisement across different communities. And I think also I'd like to underscore that, although I mentioned always out the foundation, I think of considerations of equity is, is dispossession and disruption of indigenous land tenure, but also I really want to underscore the ways in which tribes and native communities are leading the way in climate smart strategies, in um, implementation of traditional knowledge for forest health. And some of the ways the state has been a partner are through, for example, funding research through the Strategic Growth Council, California Climate Investments funds that that advance both knowledge and practice. And I can think of at least two projects, uh, the Resilient Restoration Project with the Climate Science Alliance down in San Diego, San Diego State University, UC Riverside, multiple native nations working on plant resilience, particularly oaks. Um, the Working Lands Innovation Center, which is out of UC Davis, has a partnership with uh, Palma Tribe in, in addition to other partnerships. Um, looking at um, natural soil amendments that sequester carbon. I think we need more support for active stewardship, uh, Indigenous-led stewardship projects. I have a class called Keepers in the F of the Flame that I teach in partnership with North Fork Mono Chairman Ron Good, uh, members of the Tending and Gathering Garden Steering Committee at the Nature Preserve of Cache Creek. And in that class, we're engaged in in supporting demonstration projects that showcase the positive impacts of cultural burning on raising the water table, improving plant and ecosystem health. And those are just very small demos. I, I would love to see broader level support for indigenous led burning and other land stewardship actions. We have an exciting policy on Native American ancestral lands that came out in September 2020 from the governor's office uh, that talks about increasing opportunities for co-management and investigating land transfers to tribes. Again, speaking to to Sandra's point about undoing some of the harms of the past. I don't know how broadly that's been implemented, but I think there's a lot of opportunity in that policy. Also the forest, res the forest and fire resilience plan that came out in January and the executive order on biodiversity, both mention collaborations with tribes and tribal leadership. And I know there's been a lot of tribal consultation already in this process, uh, but those are some of the examples examples that I would foreground and also just encourage us to think about, about the rural manifestations of equity and investment in rural communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm looking at the chat function and uh, Q&A function. We have a, a really good uh, question around um, uh, from Anton. And so um, I'm going to see if we can do this right and see if he wants to ask the question. 
uh, of the panel. I think I might have done that right, and hopefully uh, CC will help us if, if not. Guillermo, you're trying to unmute a, a, a speaker? And I'm sorry, Correct. can you repeat his name? It was Anton. And I'm trying to. Okay. Anton uh, Endress had a question. Okay. Sorry, I can't seem to find his name. Would you be able to? I'll read the question. Read the question. Um, yeah, I'll read uh, Anton's question. He asked the panel. Am um, I still muted? Oh, there, oh, there he is. We can hear you, Anton. Please ask a question. Okay. Um, since most state funding seems to be uh, uh, set aside for nonprofits or tribal groups or, or municipalities, it leaves relatively abandoned of support all the land holdings uh, owned by private individuals and corporations and others. How can we facilitate our collective uh, objective at this intersection of biodiversity and climate change and equity um, in a way that, you know, in, in enhances, um, induces private landowners to, to contribute into this process. Super, really super interesting question. We often think that, um, that to, to do uh, uh, conservation work, we're only looking at public lands. But you know, still in California, so much land is in private ownership, and how do we engage them? And it is something that that we talked about. And and maybe I'll ask um, Professor Shell to to comment around um, the role that private landowners have, and thinking about equity and thinking about biodiversity, and and the interplay and the role and responsibility for for the private landowner. Yeah, for sure. And I'll say even when say public dollars are meant for mostly public land, certainly private homeowners have quite a bit of kind of agency in the way in which we're able to help biodiversity. So thinking about the types of native plants that are in your yard. Oftentimes many folks will plant things because they look good, but not necessarily think about the ecological function that those plants play thinking about the ways in which you have, if for instance, you have pets, whether a cat or a dog, how that cat and dog navigates a landscape as well. So for instance, I study carnivores and know that carnivores come into conflict with each other a lot. So if you have a cat, daily PSA, keep your cat indoors because that allows not only to reduce conflict between wild carnivores, but also reduces disease dynamics on the landscape. So Toxo, for instance, isn't nearly as easily transmitted, not to mention that y'all will have a biodiversity panel here in a month, and they will certainly tell you that cats, no fault of their own, are really good predators. So they take out a lot of native birds, herps, and rodents, and we wanna keep all of them. Because imagine biodiversity essentially is our shield, right? If you only have half of the shield working, then your defense system is essentially shot. So as a private landowner, thinking about what you plant, how you manicure those lawns, how you have organisms under your jurisdiction move across the landscape. And then when you see certain animals, know that it's okay to watch them, but please definitely don't feed them, right? These are things that we have quite a bit of data on already to show that even if there aren't necessarily resources that are flowing from the cup, there certainly are small things that we can do here or there. Should also be mentioned that many private landowners have HOAs. Getting your HOAs together and talking about combined neighborhood strategies then allows for greater habitat, say, contiguousness that creates that connectivity. So there, there are solutions for sure. Thank you very much. Um, our time is, is running a little short here. Um, but I wanted to capture one more question um, and, and build off of that. And I'm gonna ask uh, Sandra to, um, to respond. The question is, uh, how can the 30 by 30 initiative 
help transition the workforce, especially in regions like Kern County, where oil and gas are the main job provider and contribute to environmental pollution. That's kind of the, the A piece of, the, of, of it. The, the B piece that I want to ask is, you know, what, what advice would you give the state of California, Sandra, today um, for the state to help increase park equity and access, especially for residents of the Central Valley? Thinking about park access and equity and thinking about that multiple benefit 30 by 30 initiative in places like Kern. How would you handle that? Yeah, so I think this is where it's really important to, to make sure that we're um, engaging in, in conversation with um, community members in, right, specifically in Kern County and in other parts of the Central Valley, because I think oftentimes I, um, there is, from my perspective, a fallacy that gets presented, right, and that's that certain sectors provide jobs. Um, and the reality, what we've heard from community is that what, what folks really want in community is socially responsible um, job employers, right, that not, not only are providing right, living wage opportunities for folks to be able to, um, to, to support their families and ultimately have some time for recreation, right? but that they also want to balance health. And what we hear time and time again is that co continuously community members are put in a position where they have to choose between employment, right? And, um, or their health, right? Or the health of their community. And what we hear a lot is the sense of, we want our community to be healthy. And so I think to Dr. Shell's point, right? It's about the ecosystem. Folks are really thinking about how do we balance, right? Having access to job opportunities. How do we balance making sure that the air, air that we breathe, right? Is supporting our, our, um, our breathing function. How do we ensure that we have opportunities for recreation in our community? And so I think that this is the conversations that we need to be to, to have about, you know, what are the, the those sectors really providing, right? And also what are they taking from our community, right? And so that those are the conversations that I think really need to be very localized and that we need to we need to engage with community about what do they want their community to look like, right? Um, and I think that goes back to right again the, the earlier question about you know, landowners, right? How do we engage, right, with, with landowners? As, you know, they're also part of the community, right? And how do we start to make sure that we're not just talking to landowners, but we're also talking to renters and that we're also talking, right, to other folks in community that, again, are all part of a community and what is the community that we want to see? And in Fresno, we've seen a lot of that play out for example, along the San Joaquin River, right? And just this kind of challenge in our community with how do we expand access to the river, not just for the folks that live adjacent to the river, but really, right, expand it as a regional um, resource, right? And, and, you know, tying it back to the fact that that is a historical, right, asset that has been utilized by local tribal communities, right? And the fact that today on the San Joaquin River Conservancy Board, there is not one tribal seat. And so one of the, the you know, the, the um, bills that's up, you know, for discussion is AB 559, which is exactly about addressing, right, that inequity. It's about expanding the current 15 member board to 17, right, and specifically adding a local tribal seat for further representation. It also changes, right, who makes the cut on the list, right, for, for consideration and appointments, right? And so we have to start opening up the table and expanding, right, the conversation to include all neighbors. And then I'll, I'll go back to, you know, the Central Valley is a really tough place for outdoor access, right? Like many communities, it, it often falls as the kind of the last uh, priority for decision makers. But it is the first priority for community. I mean, I mentioned about the fact that young people were very adamant. I mean, they didn't ask. They demanded that we talk about parks. They demanded that we make it a core right, focus of our work. And it was because they understood right, that parks really play an integral role in their upbringing and in their overall health. And so I think that there's also a role for the state to play as a lead actor in communities like the Central Valley that often have a vacuum, right, of local representation that doesn't quite yet understand, or, you know, sometimes perpetuates, right, 
um, the that racism in that way by ignoring right the call of community to actually focus on conservation and expansion of outdoor spaces. And so I think the, the state has a role to play there from a regional perspective by making sure that there is a priority, right, to, to expand access, that there's regional connectivity. And more important, what we hear time and time again is that the reason for the lack of park space in Fresno County and in the Central Valley is because there's no maintenance dollars. And so going back to people power, right, that was part of the reason why, right, Fresno we launched right, what eventually became Measure P, which was a 100% citizen-led right, measure that not just collected signatures. I mean, we circumvented the politicians essentially, right? I mean, they, they were the opposition. But I think that we really need the state to play a role in helping, re, helping create some funding streams for operations and maintenance and programming, especially in communities that don't have local leadership that, that matches the call of community. So I think there's definitely a role that the state can play there as well. Thank you, Sandra, really appreciate that. And, and just to close out, my thanks to all of the panelists who just tremendous ideas to the public with, you asked a lot of great questions. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing the public uh, comments. I, again, I think we only scratched the surface of the subject. The paper we put, put out with recommendations is only a, a, a beginning and hopefully you all jump on it. The last thing I'll say to the panelists uh, and to the public, uh, Professor Shell is teaching at Berkeley. If you wanna hear more from him and get engaged, you know, College of Natural Resources at Cal. Uh, he'll be teaching in the fall. We're super excited to have him um, on the Berkeley campus. Um, uh, Dr. Middleton Manning has published some tremendous, tremendous work um, in this area and encourage you to Google her name, read the work that she's doing. I think it's incredibly informative to all of the, the engagement and, and work going on. Uh, to Alvaro at the Green Lining Institute, who has been championing this issue for such a long time. It's critical to have advocacy. We can't move the state if we don't move the electorate and we don't move our elected officials. And so it's incredibly important to have advocates like Green Lining and so many others that are out there and engaged. You know, the resources that Marie and the core network bring to the table are just tremendous and to, to connect with all of our workforce development organizations up and down the state. It's a resource that we need to include in all of our natural climate solutions work. And if you're ever in the Central Valley, if you're in Fresno and you're seeing the changes that are happening and more green spaces, it's because of Fresno B BHC. And my thanks to Sandra and the youth leadership that's going on there. And CC, the state, thank you very much. And I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Guillermo. And um, thank you to our, our advisory panel members. You have tremendous appreciation in the audience today. Um, and thank you for the insightful dialogue. We will now move to our five minute break uh, before we enter public input. Um, and we're gonna list on the screen here, the questions that the panelists and public participants are asked to address. Uh, feel free to get up and stretch your legs and we'll come back together um, at 4.16. All right, let's take a break.
Okay, welcome back everyone from break. It's 4.16 um, and we are ready now to begin the public input portion of the workshop. Um, my co-facilitator Debbie and I will take turns managing this portion of the meeting. Um, the advisory panels insights and public input received tonight um, and through other communications will be used to develop the two strategy deliverables that Amanda and Jen spoke of. Uh, just a, a few instructions before we begin. When you registered for the workshop, you were asked to indicate whether you want to provide a 90 second verbal comment by pre-registering. If you pre-registered, you will have the opportunity today to speak first. We will stay until all pre-registered commenters have spoken. If time allows, we'll provide an opportunity for others to provide comment as well. If there's not time for you to comment, we encourage you to submit comment via email or voicemail. We will start by taking pre-registered speakers in small groups in reverse alphabet alphabetical order today by last name. We ask that you don't give or receive time to other registrants. You will have a 90 second visual timer on the screen. And to accommodate Spanish speaking commenters, we are allowing three minutes to account for interpretation needs. If you're providing your input in Spanish, we ask that you please announce that when you are unmuted so that our interpreter can prepare. In the vein of accommodating participants who are non-English speakers, we would appreciate your efforts in speaking clearly and at a reasonable, uh, reasonable pace, balancing the time that you are allotted. When you see or hear your name, please kick, click on the raise hand button at the bottom Zoom taskbar or press star nine if you're on the phone. When it's your turn, we'll ask you to unmute yourself and you can speak. If you're on the phone, you'll need to press star six. Also, please rename yourself on Zoom to match your name as registered so we don't miss you. Thank you for your patience as we navigate any technology de uh, related delays today. And also please forgive us if we mispronounce your name. Okay. So we're waiting for the screen. Okay, David, you're, we're gonna start with you today. So we're, I'm gonna read out the names. David Yao, Kylie Wright, Thomas Wheeler, John Wentworth, Andy Wellspring. I'm gonna read it again. David Yao, Kylie Wright, Thomas Wheeler, John Wentworth, and Andy Wellspring. Okay, we don't, I'm not seeing anybody on this list. So we're gonna move on to our next group. Ellen Weir, Jan Warren. Louis Villa, Terry Supahan, Edmund Sullivan. And we're asking um, you to raise your hand only right now if your name is called. Ellen Weir, Jan Warren, Louis Villa, Terry Supahan, and Edmund Sullivan. And I see Louis Via, your name is, your hand is raised. So please unmute yourself and speak. Thank you. Um, uh, these kinds of settings are so uncomfortable for me. I'm such an introvert, but I really just want to um, congratulate the Natural Resources Agency for, for putting together this wonderful panel of big picture thinkers, people who look at uh, these issues from a systems standpoint. And so I'm not sure if I'm going to provide any answers to the questions that you all put up earlier today. But I just want to say that um, equity 
ultimately means sustainability. And I think that it's very important in this work to frame it that way for yourselves, for ourselves, and for the public. It's not a political issue, it's a sustainability issue. And so let's work on this from that lens. Um, and let's also remember that 30 by 30 is not happening in a vacuum. It's happening under our current dominant socioeconomic system that I would argue is diametrically opposed to the goals of 30 by 30, not to mention the goals of, a, of an equitable, uh, equitably implemented uh, 30 by 30 effort. So these are things that we need to be honest with ourselves about um, as we do this work. So thank you. Thank you, Lewis, for your comment. I think we're going to move on to our next group of spe speakers. We have Brenton Spies, Robert Sindelar, Matthew Simmons, Fernando Serrano, and Jane Sellen. So if I call your name, please raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Brenton Spies, Robert Sindelar, Matthew Simmons, Fernando Serrano, and Jane Sellen. And again, if you're calling on the phone, it's star nine to raise your hand. Looks like we are going to move to our next group. Okay, we have Steve Scheiblauer, Sumit Sandhu, Andre Sanchez, Maricela Rosales, Silvia Romero. Okay, I'm gonna call one more time. I know uh, Andre, your hands up, so I'll be right there. Steve Scheiblauer, Sumit Sandhu, Andre Sanchez, Maricela Rosales, and Silvia Romero. Okay, um, Andre Sanchez, I'm gonna unmute you. Please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Hello, yes, thank you. Um, I wanna thank all of the panelists uh, for speaking today and for them sharing the perspective and story. Um, and I wanna thank CNRA for putting together this event. Um, you know, I'll, I'll try to keep it simple, you know, in, in the name, for the sake of time. But I just really wanna make it be known that equity should be really, you know, the, at the forefront of every decision um, along this process. Um, uh, you know, I'm not gonna go into the definition of equity at this moment, but, uh, you know, I'll just say that again, the equity should be involved in every single decision along this process. Um, you know, another important word or term that should be, uh, you know, discussed further and really figured out is, you know, what conservation means. Um, you know, as far as I can say, uh, from my perspective, conservation should definitely include elements uh, that are durable. So that being long lasting and, you know, uh, can't really be manipulated. Um, and you know, conservation should include, um, you know, developing collaborative efforts, um, you know, particularly across the different scales uh, that are being worked on in 30 by 30, um, but I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Andre, for your comment. Now we have Maricela Rosales. Maricela, I'm going to unmute you. Please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Hello everyone, Maricela Rosales with Conservation Lands Foundation. I just wanna thank all the panelists for their time and expertise. It's always amazing to hear the different modes that are valuable as it pertains to equity and how we can invest in the different notions of it. 
And so I also want to say thank you to CNRA for creating this valuable space as it is important to bring different minds together to broaden our reach as it pertains to 30 by 30. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, when I think of equity, like Luis Villa, who is from Latino Outdoors, and I appreciate his wisdom too, is that we need to see this as a sustainable measure and we need to, we need to invest across different modes and levels of what this means, which ties into how much funding we're putting into this work. Because so we can talk about equity all day and we can you know, decide how equity looks, but at the end of the day, are we putting the dollars there to make sure that we're investing in different communities and meeting them where they're at and meeting their needs and making sure that that is sustainable at the end of the day. So thank you for your time and that is my thought. Thank you, Maricela, for your comment. We have Sylvia Romero up next. Sylvia, please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Silvia Romero. Uh, Sylvia, um, vengo llegando de mi trabajo. Y moment. me gustaría también compartir que estas juntas fueran más flexibles con el tiempo para poder este, que la comunidad participe más. So, Silvia, por favor, un, un momentito, por favor. OK. Vamos, eh, porque queremos que todos escuchen sus comentarios. Eh, le pido que mantengan sus trozos de información un poco breves y de esa manera todo el mundo puede escuchar lo que tiene que decir. ¿Ya puedo seguir? Sí, adelante, por favor. ¿Sigo? Adelante, ¿Puedo, por favor. ¿Puedo ya compartir? O va a traducir. Sí, por favor. Eh, usted deme los trozos breves y ahorita lo hacemos sí, consecutivamente. Sí, ¿Sí me oye? Can, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes, we can, Victor. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, señora, ¿me puede escuchar usted? I think I will hop over into the Spanish channel and let Maricela know that uh, she can continue to speak. One moment. It's uh, Silvia Romero. Thank you. Silvia Romero, ¿sí me oye? Sí. Buenas sí. tardes. Ahora sí puede seguir con su comentario que Victor Hernández le hará la interpretación. Ok, gracias. Hablando. Yo quisiera... Yo quisiera que haya más equidad para nuestro valle de Cochela, para, que, para ser flexibles, para que todas las familias de bajos ingresos tengan la oportunidad de, de poder respirar ese aire, este, trans, ese aire fresco para nuestras familias, limpio, y, y que esas tierras públicas se sigan conservando para el futuro de nuestra comunidad y de nuestras familias, importante para nuestros hijos tener esa, esa este, historia para ellos, que es muy, muy importante que todas esas tierras se, se consigan conservando para que tengamos una vida y, y un aire de buena calidad. Muchas gracias. Eso es todo. Gracias. Gracias. So, I first of all want to mention that there will be more equity um, in the Valley of Coachella. Uh, and I ask for you all to be more flexible um, and have uh, cleaner air to breathe. Uh, we want to be able to breathe this fresh air, um, to have more access to the public lands, uh, conserve um, all of these things for our families, to have these stories to be able to tell our kids, um, and to have uh, fresh air and quality air. Victor, is that, does that conclude That concludes Sylvia's the comment? translation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Gracias, Sylvia for your comment. Um, we're going to move to our next group of pre-registered speakers. And I just wanna emphasize we're taking pre-registered speakers in last uh, reverse alphabetical order by last name. Alyssa 
Roland, Laura Rodriguez, Ariana Rickard, Cynthia Replogo, Elizabeth Reed Wainscoat. One more time. Alyssa Roland, Laura Rodriguez, Ariana Rickard, Cynthia Replogo, Elizabeth Reed Wainscoat. Okay, we have um, Laura Rodriguez up next. Laura, I'm going to unmute you. Please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Great, thank you. Hope you can hear me okay. Good afternoon, I'm Laura Rodriguez, Chief Program Officer for Justice Outside. Based in Oakland, California, I wanna echo the gratitude that folks have expressed to CNRA and um, certainly this wise and impressive panel of folks, which it's been an honor to meet and hear today. At Justice Outside, our mission is to advance racial justice and equity in the outdoor and environmental movement. So as you can imagine, these are questions that we tackle every day. Thank you so much for asking them um, and creating the space for, for folks to input. Um, an important part of our work is funding and offering capacity building to Black, Indigenous, and people of color-led um, organizations and leaders in that outdoor and environmental space. Uh, we've learned so much from folks, um, these leaders and these community partners um, over the years. And I just want to take a my remaining 30 seconds to um, address question number four around how can the state work with smaller nonprofit orgs um, to, to impact equity. And that is really to, as we talk about this idea of investment, we have to redefine and consider uh, this idea of risk. Um, we have to really reframe it because we know it's rooted to uh, problematic behaviors that we see perpetuated by initiatives when they go to fund community organizations. So I'll leave it at that, but I just really want to leave us with rethinking this idea of risk with um, as connected to investing in communities. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for your comment. Uh, we're going to move to Ariana Rickard. Ariana, I just unmuted you. Please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Thank you. I'm Arianna Rickard, political director with Together Bay Area. We're a regional coalition of almost 70 tribes, nonprofits, and agencies all working for climate resilience and equity. And I want to repeat something that one of the previous participants, Mar Maricela, already said about funding. We support the panel's recommendation and thank them for their time and work, specifically the second listed action in the summary document to establish long-term stable and dedicated funding sources for natural climate solution which is needed to target and prioritize <clears throat> resources for indigenous nations and communities of color. We hope that the legislature and governor will back up the effort to increase equity through the 30 by 30 initiative with significant funding in the state's budget. Specifically, we hope agencies like the State Coastal Conservancy will receive the funding to do the work on equity that we're talking about today. They fund several important programs that could be scaled up with additional funding like the Explore the Coast grant program, which provides coastal experiences for people and communities who might not otherwise have access to our beaches and coastal areas. Two programs that have benefited from this funding include the Amamutsin Land Trust Summer Camp for Native American Youth and Brown Girl Surf Surf Sister program. And we thank you for your leadership and we look forward to partnering with you to achieve the 30 by 30 goal. Thank you, Ariana, for your comment. Let's move on to our next group of speakers. And just as a reminder, uh, we have interpreters here, and if you could pace your uh, comment a bit, I know it's challenging with 90 seconds to speak, but uh, that would help our interpreters um, out a lot. Uh, so we have Sofia Rafikova, Chris Perry, Leslie Para, Emily Parker, and Devin O'Day. Again, I'm going to call your name. Sophia Arafikova, Chris Perry, Leslie Para, Emily Parker, and Devin O'Day. And again, if you're on the phone, it's star nine to raise your hand. Okay, we have Sophia, you're up next. Uh, please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Hello, can everyone hear me? Um, my name is Sofia Afikova. I'm policy coordinator with the Planning Conservation League. And I wanna to share today some ways we believe the 30 by 30 goal can increase equity in California. 
First, we'd like to highlight some things that were mentioned in the report that we greatly support, such as the need for long-term stable funding, the importance of giving a land stewardship to indigenous communities, and the necessity to include equity in all aspects of the 30 by 30 plan. We urge the ACNRA to prioritize these measures as the strategic plan develops. There were a few things that were not addressed in the report. One is the need to better engage disadvantaged communities in these decision-making processes. Right now, these workshops exclude a lot of individuals by being held in the middle of the workday, online, with little notice, and with a very technical focus that can be difficult to understand for those without a degree in this field. To create an inclusive stakeholder process, these workshops need to be more accessible, such as holding workshops on weekends so that people can participate without risking their jobs or paying low-income family stipends to help cover some of the costs that would prevent otherwise prevent them from attending. Another aspect is the need to not only preserve biologically diverse areas, but to also create more urban parks. The park access tool developed by the California State Parks Department reports that nearly a quarter of Californians or 9 million people live over a half a mile away from a park. These people tend to be non-white or low-income families. After living for over a year in lockdown, I'm sure everyone here understands the value that access to outdoors has on physical mental health. To promote equitable access, we have to ensure that every neighborhood in California has access to a park. Thank you, Sophia, for your comment. Um, now we have Devin O'Day. Devin, please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I wanna echo the thanks to CNRA and to all the panelists. Um, there are some inspiring things said, and I'm with Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. I'm the California chapter coordinator. And I wanna talk about equity as it relates to um, access to areas that you can hunt and fish and, and also quality habitats. Um, as someone who personally engages in hunting and fishing to feed my family, uh, an organic, wild, uh, healthy food source, that's what drives me and that's what drives a lot of our members. Um, and I, I can say from a firsthand perspective that access to these resources is not equitable. Um, there are a lot of communities that do not have the same access that uh, uh, that my personally that I do, and um, we work very hard to encourage that access. And it's not just um, places that you're legally allowed to hunt and fish, but it's also the habitats, the connectivity of those habitats, the quality of the water, um, and the the wildlife um, that exists there. So um, I urge the thirty by thirty effort to um, look at habitat connectivity and especially the areas where there are underprivileged communities and there, there is an opportunity to improve the wildlife and the waters and the habitat in those locations. Thank you all. Thank you, Devin, for your comment. We're going to move to the next group of speakers. Okay, we have Marvin Norman, Dan Noble, Pamela Nelson, and Vanessa Moreno. Again, we have Marvin Norman, Dan Noble, Pamela Nelson, and Vanessa Moreno. Okay, Vanessa, I'm going to unmute you. Please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Hi everyone, my name is Vanessa Moreno. I'm the Coachella Program Coordinator with COFIM, Council of Mexican Federations in North America. Uh, we have an environmental program dedicated to engaging the Latinx community and conservation efforts. And while we really try our best to engage them and um, you know be present in this workshop, it's really difficult when uh, they don't have the technology or the resources or it's not accessible. A lot of them could not be here today because they work or or you know, have other family commitments. And so as mentioned uh, through a previous comment, uh, workshops in the weekends could probably work better for them. Um, I also wanted to flag that uh, when we talk about equity, we're talking about accountability. And the report was, was good, but I also like to think about long-term funding as something that's needed. We often see in our community's members um, say that there's a lot of funds that come and there's programs, but then while they become engaged, 
it's very temporary. And then before they know it, the program's gone, the fundings are gone, the funds are gone. And for them, it's just something that is unfortunate because they want to be involved and they want to make sure that they're also engaging their other community members and their families to become better advocates for our Coachella Valley. Um, and my, my time's up, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll be submitting other comments, but thank you so much. Thank you, Vanessa, for your comment. Um, I think we're going to move on to our next group of speakers. Okay, we have Takashi Mizuno, Leticia Miller, John McCall, Claire McAdams, Enrico Mastro Donato. Again, we have T Takashi Mizuno, Leticia Miller, John McCall, Claire McAdams, Enrico Mastro Donato. Okay, we have Leticia. Thank you for being patient. Please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Hi, um, this is Leticia Miller. I'm from the Pascanta Band and Omlaki Indians. I'm the tribal tribes vice chair, and I'm also the interim uh, tribal resource officer and TIPO, all of it. Um, we're still learning this stuff, but I wanted to thank you for, um, like everyone else, thank you for having this opportunity for us to get together because I feel like we're all trying to do the same thing, but we're also disconnected and we need to come together as one nation or one group. Um, I'm, I wanted to um, give a shout out because um, I'm working with the Machupta tribe in, the, in Butte County, who's doing a great job with TEK, Ali Metters Knight um, from the Machupta tribe. She's been teaching us um, TEK, and she's also been um, um, including the community as well, the non-native community. Um, and we have a, she has a workforce that gets contracts with um, landowners and the uh, BLM property to go up and do fire um, restoration and so forth. So I um, look forward to her comment. She'll be um, sending a comment in about her, her um, ideas and her program. and. Um, we're also trying to uh, do it on our reservation here in uh, Tehama County, too. We'll be doing one on 26. So um, speaking about being fair, different areas around here and the tribal leaders that want to be involved. So thank you. Thank you, Leticia. Sorry, I think you cut out a little bit at the end. Hopefully we caught everything um, that you shared. Okay, um, next up we have Rico Mastro Donato. Rico, please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Uh, hi, good evening. Uh, thank you all and thank the panelists. This has been great. Um, I just want to state that I think it's important that we create metrics to judge our progress by. Uh, one of your callers earlier mentioned the 9 million people that don't have park access in California within a half mile or a 10 minute walk, which is what the Trust for Public Land uses. I'm the government relations lead for the Trust for Public Land. And I also wanna say that, um, you know, nature-based solutions have been very dependent on bonds, entirely dependent on bonds. And now we have a surplus. We can't, you know, rely on a surplus or bonds actually to reach our goal here. And I think it's important that we figure out how to get the private sector involved in investing in nature-based solutions. Um, it's been an easier path for energy and clean cars and things like that. But uh, I don't think our sector is necessarily looked at uh, as an economic engine uh, like it should be. And I think it's incredibly important to connect those dots and to reach out to that sector if we're really going to meet the goal that your panel came up with for sustainable funding, um, we have to engage the uh, private sector in a way that, um, you know, is more successful than what we've had uh, up to this point. So thank you again for uh, the panelists were great and the callers have been great as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rico, for your comment. I'm going to take our next group of speakers now. And we're about halfway through our speaker list. Uh, we have Arthur Levine, Robert Landers, Julia Jordan, Connor Jandreau, and Gary Hughes. I'm gonna repeat the list one more time. Arthur Levine, Robert Landers, 
Julia Jordan, Connor Jandro, and Gary Hughes. And it looks like we have Gary Hughes. Gary, go ahead and unmute yourself and provide your comment. All right, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Gary Hughes. I currently work as the California Policy Monitor with an international organization called Biofuel Watch. I very much appreciate this workshop and I appreciate the effort of the California Natural Resources Agency to bring the panelists together. And I was very relieved to hear that the panelists are still here. These uh, formats are really rough and I, I think they're um, antagonistic to public participation. I'm, uh, you know, I just want to flag that there's a major controversy right now at Jackson Demonstration State Forest. This is public land. It belongs to the state. It's managed by CAL FIRE. CAL FIRE is logging it right now. Uh, there's protests. There's people tree sitting in the Pomo. People from the Keore Valley Rancheria have asked that the logging stop, but the logging continues. Uh, so I think there's a lot of stuff happening on the ground that this workshop hasn't really addressed. There's a certain degree of erasure of the way that wealth and power has created inequity, especially in um, you know those lands that are called natural and working lands. Um, it's kind of a euphemism. It's really strange, the whole thing. I've been tracking it for years. But this uh, approach regarding equity is really important. And what I didn't mention, was the inequity happening with labor in uh, the forestry sector with biomass and you know forest health stuff. So there's a lot to be dealt with here. Gary, thank you for your comment. We're going to move on to our next group of speakers. We have John Hopkins, Araceli Hernandez, Pedro Hernandez, Clara Herrera, and Rosalind Halfand. John Hopkins, Araceli Hernandez, Pedro Hernandez, Clara Herrera, and Rosalind Halfand. And we have Pedro. Please unmute yourself and provide your comment, Pedro Hernandez. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pedro Hernandez. Um, on behalf of Audubon, California, we're super interested in following this conversation and definitely urge CRNA to incorporate equity in every step of the process and in consideration for approving projects in the Natural uh, Working Lands Climate Smart Strategy and the 30 by 30 Pathways document. I think it's also going to be super integral to um, support um, long-term sustainable sources of funding, um, not only to meet the current um, gaps, but also to um, meet this 30 by 30 goal, which by all intents and measures, it seems like California's most ambitious conservation policy as well too. Um, furthermore, within the funding um, discussion, I think it's gonna also be important to have um, set-asides for disadvantaged communities to be intentional and to ensure that these programs um, and that the, there is funding reaching them um, historically, many state agencies and programs have underfunded um, these communities as well, too. So I think that's one of the ways we can more intentionally direct um, energies and efforts. I also think it's going to be important to consider equity from a lens of restoring ecological services and thinking on an eco ecosystem level and um, an ecosystem health level as well, too, to support, um, for example, drought resilience um, in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, also, I think it's important to consider rural communities, not only with park access, but improving the land uses around them as well, too, like farm lands. So thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Okay, we have uh, Clara Herrera next. Clara, please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Okay, buenas tardes. Mi comentario va a ser en español. Clara, just one moment. Yes, we'll get uh, our interpreter on and we'll give you three minutes. Thank you. Ok, muy bien. Eh, tiene tres minutos, señora. Ok, ok. Mi nombre es Clara Herrera. Uh, yo vivo en el desierto de California. My name Pero is Clara mi... Hernández, and then I live in the California desert. Um, pe... Mi trabajo es cerca de las montañas que nos pertenecen al Monumento Nacional, que viene siendo las montañas de San Jacinto y Santa Rosa. 
Uh, my job is closer to the hills, closer to the monument, uh, which are closer to the um, valley of the Santa Clara Mountains. Santa Rosa and San Jacinto. I'm sorry, the Santa Rosa. Um, para mí me gustaría que pusieran más atención en las construcciones de casas muy grandes, donde yo me doy cuenta que esa área es donde transitan muchas aves. For me, what's more important is that there be more attention paid to the construction of the houses, um, which affect the, um, the, the birds. Es donde tenemos nuestros cimarrones que están en peligro de extinción. Which we have our synagogues that are in danger of extinction. Y esas construcciones afectan mucho. And those constructions affect a lot. Um, um, espero que este movimiento sea todo un éxito, el 30 por 30, y que nuestras tierras sean públicas y no privadas. Y gracias por, um, por darnos esa oportunidad. I hope that this uh, 30 by 30 project is a success and that the lands, the public lands, are converted into public lands. And thank you very much for taking my comment. And I hope that, that this lands become cleaner so that it'll be more beneficial to our children and to the our people. Y que right. si se puede. And it can be done. Gracias, Clara, for your comment. Um, Thank you. We will move on to Rosalind Helfand. Rosalind, please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Hi, this is Rosalind Helfand. Um, just a few points. I think it's really important to review um, the underlying systems and structures during this process that can get in the way of really equitable climate smart strategies. So that can include legal systems, economic systems, and really kind of do a review of some of those challenges and barriers that are deep down underneath some of our ability to exceed. Succeed. I also think that um, some proactive public awareness raising of this process, so much broader, deeper public awareness raising across different communities, and different socioeconomic parts of the state, um, so that people really have an understanding of why this is happening and want to participate um, in it and have ideas for how to participate. Um, and then I think we should need to be mindful at all stages about geographic representation, because I think there are some embedded biases based on geographic representation. And that includes even on the expert panels is being more mindful about the range of representation across the state where the experts are based, where they're coming from. Um, and finally, just as a program to recommend as a model, I think the LA Audubon Society has a great intergenerational mentoring program that's about ecosystem res restoration and environmental education. It's people from high school, college, elementary, but they, they mentor each other as they rise up through those different levels. And it's a great program to look at. Thank you, Rosalind. Um, I'm going to take Julia Jordan next. She was on the former list. Julia, please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Hi, good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Hi, thank you so much, Julia Jordan with Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Um, I missed my, my turn on the last slide, so thank you for coming back. Um, I just wanted to um, thank you for, for hosting this and to the panelists for their recommendations. Um, I think there are a few things that that uh, we're planning on providing some comments on, but I just wanted to emphasize a couple um, around just echoing some of the other comments on making sure that there's equitable park and green space that is able to serve um, both urban and rural communities. I think there's at times kind of a misconception that rural areas are sort of um, flush with green space when in reality there's a lot of sort of industrial and agricultural land uses that still prevent um, communities from being able to access those lands. Um, and I think there were some really interesting things brought up in the report from the equity panel around anti-displacement strategies as well to avoid unintended consequences of 
or impacts of, of park development. Um, and then secondly, just wanted to also uplift the kind of need to think about agricultural land conservation in relationship to farmer equity, um, access for black, indigenous, Latinx, Asian farmers, as well as benefits to environmental justice communities and, and farm workers who are impacted by, you know, water and air quality, as well as pesticide use. Um, and that being a really, really important part of conservation as well. So I'll leave it there with time running out. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And thank you for everyone for honoring our time limit here, to be fair. Um, let's move on to our next group of speakers. We have Laurel Harkness, Mary Hanna, Raymond Gutierrez, Manny Gones, and Stephen Getz. We have Laurel Harkness, Mary Hanna, Raymond Gutierrez, Manny Gones, and Stephen Getz. I'm gonna take Laurel Har Harkness first. Laurel, please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Great, thanks so much. Uh, I uh, appreciate this presentation and the discussion. I am representing the Siskiyou Outdoor Recreation Alliance. The 60% of the land in Siskiyou County is uh, US Forest Service and our county ranks 57th of 58 counties in public health outcomes. And by every measure, we're among the most socially and economically dis disadvantaged counties in the state. So equity and access to outdoor recreation opportunities is of high priority. Uh, equity looks and feels different in every community and database methods, standards, and practices don't always translate from one community then to the next in California. So there is a need to empower local equity solutions that are relevant uh, within our rural setting. Uh, in the ESRI initiative for the Pathways to 30 by 30, in order to advance equity, there really needs to be GIS layers representing outdoor recreation supply and demand included in the analysis. It'd be a missed opportunity not to spatially and strategically align biodiversity, conservation, and outdoor recreation. Uh, there's a need for state level leadership in support of outdoor recreation and equity in order to coordinate efforts in a sustained way. Uh, I'd like to see sustained cross-jurisdictional collaboration specifically through the alignment of the uh, Climate Smart Strategy with the objectives in the Forest Service and California Shared Stewardship Agreement. Uh, uh, the state needs to engage in the Forest Service uh, management planning and invest in regional collaboratives to advance these goals. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Laurel, for your comment. Next, uh, we're going to Manny Gomez. Manny, go ahead and unmute yourself and provide comment. Good afternoon, I'm Manny Gomez, Tree People's Policy Director. From Tree People's perspective, 30 by 30 in the natural working lands, climate smart strategy are vehicles to address the climate crisis in an equitable way. These strategies must account for the disproportionate impacts frontline urban communities and low income communities of color have endured for far too long. Dedicated investments in programs that utilize nature-based solutions like CAL FIRE's urban and community forestry and CNRA's urban greening programs are vital to address environmental health while providing multiple co-benefits. 30 by 30 cannot be achieved without multi-benefit urban projects. Green jobs with local hire provisions are essential to cultivating the next generation environmental stewards while providing a living wage for black indigenous and people of color. Lastly, it's important to follow the lead of CBOs that have a proven track record of meaningful community engagement that is both culturally sensitive and inclusive. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. Uh, Stephen Getz, you're next. Please unmute and provide your comment. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, I represent the Benicia Tree Foundation, and we also work with the local chapter of the California Native Plant Society in developing urban greening projects using native trees. I'd like the state through its 30 by 30 project con to consider urban greening on the over 350,000 acres of right of way owned and controlled by Caltrans. Low income communities and communities of color are frequently located adjacent to this right of way. These communities suffer from air and noise pollution generated by the traffic on these highways and the higher temperatures generated by the pavement that covers the right of way. We model our projects after the recommendations developed by our air district for schools that are located adjacent to freeways. 
They recommend that you plant large trees between the traffic lanes and the schools. We would plant native trees because they are drought tolerant, low maintenance, and they have the potential to reduce noise, air pollution, and cool ambient temperatures and clean our stormwater runoff from the freeways. Unfortunately, Caltrans does not have the capacity to maintain these kind of projects. They have only two full-time employees assigned to maintain landscaping in all of Solano County. So we can't really plant any trees on the freeways with this kind of staffing. So we would really support the recommendation to establish long-term stable dedicated funding sources for projects such as this so Caltrans can uh, maintain these kind of urban greening projects. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for your comment. We're gonna take the next group of speakers. We have Jamie Go, Daniel Glusenkamp, Rebecca Garcia, Brenda Gallegos, and Emily Finnegan. So we have Jamie Go, Daniel Glusenkamp, Rebecca Garcia, Brenda Gallegos, and Emily Finnegan. Okay, let's see. Jamie, I'm gonna unmute you and please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Hi, this is Jamie Go providing comments on behalf of the Parks Now Coalition. First, just wanted to echo others, thanks to the Resources Agency for putting the workshop together and the opportunity to comment. It's really exciting to see the level of engagement on equity, but I did wanna raise that as we think about equity, we also need to be thinking specifically about access and how to make sure that's more equitable. And I think that's gonna be more about more than improving physical access to outdoor spaces, but also about removing cultural and institutional barriers, workforce development, and other things. Improving ac equitable access to the outdoors was a priority, which was specifically outlined in the executive order. So I think it's really important that we recognize that it's a distinct and complementary priority as promoting equity writ large. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Next, we have Daniel Glusenkamp. Daniel, go ahead and unmute and provide your comment. Okay, hola, me llamo Daniel Glusenkamp with the California Institute for Biodiversity. Oh. Daniel? Can I, uh, may I ask you to hold on for a second? And I, I can yeah. complete my comments in, in English to make it simpler. Um, I oh, want to okay. amplify the comments by Vanessa Moreno and, and talk about how to advance equity sustainably in a way that we can ensure that all communities are included, not just in receiving benefits from 30 by 30, but in deciding. And I think we have to recognize that, you know, we've been propagating a dominant paradigm that um, provides opportunity to be a scientist, a planner, and an elected official, um, restricts it really to certain groups and certain communities and locations. And, and those people have prioritized their communities and the areas that they know and that they love. And we really need to expand the opportunity for Californians to be a scientist or a decision maker so that we ensure that communities are deciding and that individuals from communities are deciding where the assets and where the opportunities go rather than just asking for it or being given it. And, and we see this in the legislature today where we have Luz Rivas and Cristina Garcia and Senator Kamlager and Lorena Gonzalez, people who've come in and, and actually are fundamentally changing how California invests in things. I think, and so I, I hope that we can think about how to provide fellowships and service year programs with living salaries and that obviously transition into jobs, not just jobs fighting fires or doing kind of very kind of, you know, ground level work, but in the skills and the fields that are really needed to actually do 30 by 30, where we are giving people opportunity to be trained as biologists, as conservation scientists, as project designers, so that they're actually, they are the ones deciding where things get allocated, that they are doing the biology and building the maps to identify the biodiversity that they need to protect. And their communities are benefiting, not because the communities are good at asking or deserve what they're being given. Daniel. But I'm going to have to uh, just stop you there and ask you to provide the rest of your comment in writing or by uh, voicemail. Thank you. We just want to be fair to other speakers who honor the time. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, next up we have Rebecca Garcia. Rebecca, go ahead and unmute and provide your comment. 
Hello. Um, hopefully the background noise isn't too bad, but thank you for leading the space and the conversation today. My name is Rebecca. I'm here as a policy advocate with CAUSE, Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy. We're a community organization that advocates on behalf of working class and immigrant families. Climate strategies to conserve California's working lands have potential for not only carbon sequestration, but also public health and social equity benefits in some of our most disadvantaged rural communities. However, they also present implementation challenges, including the risk of providing offsets for pollution allowances in environmental justice communities without clear accountability and state funds disproportionately benefiting large corporate landowners without equitable benefits for BIPOC and small scale farmers, farm workers and local communities. Communities. Existing agricultural conservation efforts, while necessary, too often ignore the co equal importance of air and water quality, pesticide reduction, biodiversity, farmer equity and land access, and surrounding community benefits, all of which should be integral parts of agricultural conservation. In order for equity to remain a priority throughout this process, the populations most impacted by environmental racism have to be at the center of the conversation and the final decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Next up, we have Brenda Gallegos. Brenda, go ahead and unmute and provide your comment. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Brenda Gallegos. I am with Hispanic Access Foundation. I'd like to start off by thanking the panelists who authored the Nature-Based Solution to Advance Equity Report. I appreciate any steps that CNRA and state agency partners can take towards ensuring that efforts at educating and outreaching to communities of color is crafted by individuals or teams from within these communities whenever possible. There is no doubt that providing appropriate sensitivity in your communications will be needed to ensure our communities are fully engaged in protecting, managing, and benefiting from public lands. I frequent many public lands in the area, and I definitely feel alienated by signage that feels dismissive of a multicultural approach. Another equity issue to address is a lack of outreach to communities of color to provide them with the education, training, and opportunities to make your workforce look more diverse and reflective of the state of California. Also, um, I believe the CNRA definition of equity must include the four equity lenses, which include access, representation, uh, meaningful participation and quality experiences um, and outcomes. Access includes walkable distances to nature and various transit access options to parks and open space, including public transportation. Um, warped around community engagement, which includes the community and development of programs, cultural based um, place-based reciprocal education includes indigenous and immigrant community members. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brenda. We're moving on to our next group of speakers. Okay, we have Lisa Fimiani, Belinda Faustinos, Andrew Escamilla, Lauren Alachi, Ashley Eagle Gibbs. One more time. We have Lisa Vimiani, Belinda Faustinos, Andrew Escamilla, Lauren Ilachi, Ashley Eagle Gibbs. Okay, going to Belinda. Please unmute and provide your comment. Great, thank you so much for the opportunity and uh, fully appreciate all of the panel speakers and uh, the representatives that have been discussing these issues and uh, CNRA for really addressing uh, the issues of equity as, it, as they pertain uh, to 30 by 30 and climate smart strategies. I can't be overstated and I think I just want to echo what many, many of the public comments have come in as and from the panelists. Uh, that equity, of course, should be at the center of all of these policy discussions. Uh, all elements of this uh, effort really need to be considered through that equity lens because of the history of disinvestment uh, in these issues historically. And this is not just the state of California. It's happened at local government, as uh, Sandra pointed out, uh, federal government. It's uh, been very, uh, unfortunately, historically uh, true that, that these disinvestments have hit uh, communities of color and Native tribes uh, to an extraordinary degree. 
and I won't repeat, you know, what others have said, but I just want to say that, you know, uh, the the recent does um, statements made by Brenda, Manny, uh, Pedro, all I think echo what uh, many of us in the state, you know, and, and whether we're from North Northern California, Southern California, the Central uh, Valley, it's just really important that uh, we address the issues of equity in a way that are are really, um, you know, heartfelt, meaningful, uh, will allow for actual strategies to be developed that are implemented implementable by the state. Uh, that is, I think, a critical, critical issue is that we, we need to make sure that we have paths forward, uh, that we can see some progress made on these issues. And, and my time is up. So we'll write some written comments. Thank you, Belinda. Next up, we have Andrew Escamilla. Andrew, please unmute yourself and provide comment. Hi, good evening. My name is Andrew Escamilla, checking in from Fresno, California, as a member of the greater Fresno community, along with California League of Conservation Voters. Uh, to start off, yes, I'll, I'll agree that too often equity is not properly considered, planned for, executed um, within these government programs that have typically been you know, um, produced. And it's important for us to commit to practice racial equity in the design of these strategies. Secondly, Local perspectives and voices are crucial for these state initiatives to feel authentic and to have outcomes that are equally met with, from their intent. Fresno and Kern County historically have been um, covered by industries in, in involving agriculture and oil and gas, where there are lar large BIPOC populations. And so this, I would say, requires special attention from the 30 by 30 initiative to be equitable in its investment in farmland communities, public lands, and people. Moreover, the interaction between oil production, pollution, and access to clean water create a compelling environmental justice issue that articulates a unique opportunity throughout the San Joaquin Valley for the state to make amends for the historic underinvestment in the region. Lastly, what happens when you truly fully invest in someone and their livelihood? What happens when historical divestment and underinvestment reach an unprecedented levels of inequity? I urge the CNRA and the 30 by 30 initiative to lead with rural inland communities and tribes to ensure equitable solutions are planned for and met. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Next up, we have Lauren Ilachi. Lauren, go ahead and unmute and provide your comment, please. Thank you. My name is Lauren Alashi, and I am a landscape architect at Kikui Design Initiative, a nonprofit design and community development organization based in Southern California. I focus my work on the Salton Sea and in the Eastern Coachella Valley, which is a rural agricultural region that is often overlooked and that I would encourage the state to focus on as part of this work. I echo the previous comments regarding the importance of meaningful and sustained community engagement local solutions created in coordination with CBOs and community members and identifying long term funding for the work, particularly in these rural areas that have been largely ignored and are shouldering heavy environmental injust injustice burdens in addition to high levels of poverty. I also want to emphasize something that was brought up in the panel that different communities and cultures utilize and perceive parks and open spaces in different ways, largely because many are historically left out of the programming and design processes of these spaces. I live in Los Angeles where 44% of the city does not have access to a park uh, by TPL standards and 82% of those without access are low income communities of color. But even further, there is substantive substantive research that people of different genders experience, perceive, and use open space differently. Women of color comprise 72% of LA's female population, and therefore it stands to reason that women and girls of color are, are the most disadvantaged when it comes to accessing the spaces. I would encourage the state to include specific gender-based equity parameters as part of the work, and thank you so much for the panel today and looking forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Lauren. Let's move to our next group of speakers. And just as a reminder, we um, are asking you to pace your, your speech a little slower just so that um, our interpreters can manage and um, interpreting. Uh, okay, next on the list, uh, Gladwin D'Souza, Melanie Cohen, Jennifer Clark, Moises Cisneros, and Sandra Cattell. 
Again, we have Gladwin D'Souza, Melanie Cohen, Jennifer Clark, Moises Cisneros, and Sandra Cattell. Looks like we have Sandra. Go ahead, Sandra, and uh, unmute and provide your comment. Thank you. Uh, we need funding for equity. We need access to public lands for all, increasing public transportation, and eliminating park fees. Uh, we need to protect our lands from being loved to death with adequate supervision and attention to the little things like trash service. We need to protect natural and cultural resources. We need to prioritize outdoor education in our schools. Uh, uh, we should expand funding for successful programs like Outdoor Science School. And we should promote field trips for all grade levels for educational experiences in the outdoors. Uh, we need urban parks close to people, more of them, uh, and ongoing protection for them so they're not sold to the first developer who has a great development that will generate funds for their city. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. We have Moises Cisneros. Moises, please unmute and provide your comment. Buenas tardes. Mi mensaje será entregado en español. Moises, um, can I ask you to just, just hold until we have our interpreter ready? And we're going to give you three minutes. Thank Do you, Sister. Have... Moises. Okay, um, me puede seguir adelante. Si me permite, mantenga sus trozos de información cortos para que todos puedan uh, escuchar lo que tenga que decir. Gracias. Adelante. Buenas tardes a todos. Primeramente, gracias, estimados panelistas, por sus valiosos comentarios y un reconocimiento especial para el CNRA. So, first of all, good afternoon and thank you very much for this uh, valuable panel uh, and a great recognition to CNRA. El 10% de todo el carbón de California se encuentra secuestrado en los suelos de los desiertos de California. So 10% of all car sequestered uh, carbon it finds itself in the deserts of California. La perturbación masiva de las tierras desérticas de California devolvería el carbón al aire y eliminaría una solución natural para secuestrar este carbón. So the perturbation of all of, the massive perturbation of all of this carbon and letting it all out would eliminate the sequestration of carbon in California. Esto es especialmente difícil para las comunidades de color que residen en grandes cantidades a lo largo de los cor corredores de la transportación y logística entre Los puertos gemelos de Los Angeles y Long Beach. So this is really hard for uh, communities of color that receive all of this through the long uh, transportation corridors and the two ports of Long Beach and LA. Molestar o alterar el secuestro de carbón del desierto empeora las cosas en estas comunidades. So to bother or alter this uh, sequestered carbon and these places uh, is bad. El aire en los condados de San Bernardino y Riverside y sus alrededores ya es el más contaminado del país, lo que hace el secuestro de carbón del desierto cercano sea de vital importancia para la equidad, nuestra salud y los problemas de justicia ambiental. Thank you. That concludes just, just a moment. I'm sorry, oh. CC. I'm going to interpret what he just said. Just give me okay. a second. So, the air by Santa Barbara and Riverside is the most contaminated air in the country. So, it's vitally important for, uh, as far as uh, equity and health, for to maintain the. Uh, health of the environment. Y este mensaje era, era acerca de, no, no es de Santa Bárbara, es de San Bernardino. Y gracias por su atención y la oportunidad para dar mi comentario. 
So this message isn't from Santa Barbara, it's from San Bernardino. And thank you very much for allowing me to provide this uh, comment. Does that conclude Moise's comment? Thank you, yes, Susie. Just wanna confirm, okay, thank you, Moises, and thank you, Victor. Um, we are going to move on to our next group of speakers. We have Alan Carlton, Sarah Cardona, John Buckley, Victoria Brandon, and Jenny Binstock. I'm gonna call the list one more time. Alan Carlton, Sarah Cardona, John Buckley, Victoria Brandon, and Jenny Binstock. And star nine if you're on the phone. Jenny, I'm going to uh, unmute you. Please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, great. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jenny Binstock. I'm with the Sierra Club. Major thanks to the panelists and the conversation today for CNRA's commitment to ensuring equity is a part of this process. And I'm excited to see how the new Assistant Secretary for Equity and Environmental Justice is going to help lead this work. Um, I want to really applaud the panel's report and that it explicitly names that we must, quote, acknowledge, atone for, and deconstruct systems of oppression and that colonization, white supremacy, and capitalism are named as these systems. And moving forward, I think it's essential that we get very specific about what actions through this process we can take to meaningfully address harm and deconstruct those systems. So I hope that CNRA will enlist impacted communities themselves to lead the design of those specifics, giving them the authority to name and shape what restorative justice efforts look like, how we uh, reimagine what participatory policy, budgeting, and planning looks like with communities, and most certainly weigh in on what ways uh, resources are being allocated. And related, it has been voiced today and also in the summary report, without deep and sustained community engagement, we're not gonna get there, right? Um, and as Sandra said in the panel, we need real outcomes for people and intent must match those outcomes. So um, to do this level of expansive community engagement, you know, it takes time. It's highly involved. It's really challenging while we're pushed by the urgency of the moment, but just as urgent as it is for the climate and for our biodiversity, the state produces a roadmap for 30 by 30. It is also critical that the state is adequately resourced, that you are all adequately resourced to do the level of engagement that is required for this to be truly transformational. And anything less is indirect conflict with you know, the stated intent. So I really wanna urge CNRA to consider forming a diverse stakeholder advisory committee of NGOs, CBOs, and community representatives that can really advise and help you lead this process and ensure it's co-created by and accountable to our shared values. And I also want to urge that CNRA partner with and adequately resource CBOs, as others have said, to conduct needs assessments and lead engagement efforts because they obviously possess the greatest expertise in their communities. Um, that's it, thank you so much again for all of the amazing uh, work tonight. Thank you, Jenny, for your comment. We're gonna move on to our next group of speakers. Okay, and I believe this, um, this is the last group and then we'll circle back with those we missed. Cindy Barrows. Alfredo Arandondo, apologies. Kimberly Anderson, Denise Allen, Jared Aldern, Sarah Aird. Again, we have Cindy Barros, Alfredo Arandondo, Kimberly Anderson, Denise Allen, Jared Aldern, and Sarah Aird. Okay, we have Cindy Barrows. Uh, go ahead and unmute and provide your comment, please. Muy buenas tardes, good afternoon. My name is Cindy Hernandez Orellana Barrows. I am with COFEM. I live and work in the Coachella Valley, the traditional homeland of the Cahuilla people. The Coachella Valley is located in the Colorado desert, part of the Sonoran Desert. And the absence of equity in the Coachella Valley has resulted in the lack of access to green spaces in lower income communities primarily occupied by people of color. Most, if not all of our local hiking trails and other recreational opportunities are primarily located in white affluent communities. 
I consider myself fortunate to live in a very special place where we have flora and fauna that are endemic to the Coachella Valley. Our desert is also home to endangered and threatened species, such as the peninsular bighorn sheep, obese canadensis, and desert tortoise, gopher ogasisi. Our desert, our home, is a biological hotspot with an array of different habitat ranges in elevation from below sea level to over 8,000 feet above sea level. I consider California deserts, which cover an extensive part of California, to be a vital component of any 30 by 30 action plan and invite you to include all California deserts and the Salton Sea in any plan and conversation moving forward to ensure that future generations can enjoy the beauty, the physical and mental health benefits our public lands offers. Thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to provide public comments. Thank you, Cindy. Um, we will, um, Jen, is it okay if we take uh, any unregistered uh, speakers that we've missed and then go to break? Okay. Uh, we are at the end of our speaker list and we wanted to see if we missed anybody the first round um, and please raise your hand. Uh, we have two uh, speakers that we missed. And then we're going to go to break. Okay, uh, Leah Mendez, go ahead and speak. Hello, um, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm um, uh, signing in today from Bakersfield, California, my hometown. And um, this is a region that um, there's experiences a lot of um, environmental justice issues that have been touched upon by other uh, panelists and speakers today. Um, I just want to express um, my, my biggest dream for our town is that um, we would be able to restore the flow of water to the Kern River through the city of Bakersfield. Um, this would help achieve not just uh, safeguarding our biodiversity, it would also help alleviate some of these um, social and environmental injustice issues by uh, enhancing access to green space um, for urban residents. Um, and, you know, there's also, of course, a need to, um, I think, have a long term vision for new um, green parks and preserves. Um, and also, of course, you know, desert scape <laughs> parks and preserves because the San Joaquin Desert, um, you know, does not experience the amount of rainfall that. Uh, a non-desert would. So, um, uh, and I think that, you know, again, outdoor education programs to help connect students to a sense of place, pride and belonging in these spaces is something that I would also hope to see um, some um, guidance and funding for as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leah. And um, I see we have some speakers um, that are not on the speaker list. So I, I wanna take this opportunity to take a break and we'll come back and take uh, names from our audience, our general audience. So let's take a 10 minute break now and then we'll come back and take uh, more comment input. Let's see, um, we'll come back at uh, 5.37.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back from the break. This is Debbie Schechter, and I'll be taking over facilitation from CC. So thanks so much for all the great comments so far. Uh, as CC mentioned, we do have time to take comments from folks who did not pre-register to speak. So uh, we're happy that we can do that. So again, if you would like to provide uh, 90 seconds of public input, please uh, raise your hand and I'll call on you in the order in which I see the hands raised. All right, so Jen Simmons, you are first on my list. So please unmute yourself and go ahead and provide your comment. Hello, thank you so much. My name is Jen Simmons. I reside on Chumash land, known to some as Mid-City Los Angeles. I am here representing the organizing department of the Sierra Club. I first want to thank the speakers on today's panel who presented a mosaic of equity definitions and practices. Thank you for showing up fully for us. Now I'd like to provide some friendly feedback on the structure of these public facing programs in regards to equity. First, a land acknowledgement. It's important that we recognize the original owners of the land we stand upon. And even though we are still in Zoom land, making it a practice to speaking the names out, out loud of the native tribes whose land we are inhabiting. Secondly, I'm happy these panels are based in science, but it seems to skew to favor Western science over indigenous wisdom. And indigenous wisdom needs to be part of every conversation on public lands. Lastly, when we talk about equity, we also need to really consider the financial equity component. Who owns the lands we desperately want to protect and maybe who should own the lands. The best way to steward biodiversity and ecosystems is to give the land back to its original indigenous owners. And I would like more consideration paid to indigenous tribes financial equity stakes in this conversation. Thank you for listening to public communities and allowing the public to influence this important process. Thank you, Jen, for your comment. Uh, next up is Reza Barrias. So please unmute yourself and go ahead. Um, it looks like Reza may just have dropped off or lowered her hand. Oh, there she is. Go ahead, Reza. There we go. Thank you so much. The unmute didn't come up. My name is Reza Barrias. I live in the city of Adelanto on historic Serrano land, um, and I work for the California League of Conservation Voters. It's notable that despite these aspirational discussions of equity, many affected communities have thus far not been mentioned or considered in these reports and solutions. For example, the workshop on expanding climate action through nature-based solutions didn't mention desert once despite the high risk of desert ecosystem collapse in the face of climate change and disaster. It's essential to actually achieve equitable outcomes, or it's essential to actually achieve equitable outcomes in this process to identify who is missing from these conversations and panels and assure that the plans we make based on these collective reports and public comments accounts for these voices. More specifically, in our discussions of equity, we need to consider the potential of this process to affect high impact change in deeply marginalized communities by preventing the commercialization and abuse of lands and their natural resources. Corporations often take advantage of low income BIPOC communities like the Inland Empire with promises of work and local revenue, but they fail to mention that they'll destroy our local ecosystems in the process. Therefore, I ask that water protection and stopping the spread of warehousing in the Inland Empire are addressed as we solidify next steps in this process. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reza. Our next speaker is Berna Idris. Berna, if you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Berna, are you able to unmute? Yes, hello, can you Great. hear me? Yes, go ahead. So my name is Berna Idris. I'm calling from Ohlone Land. I'm based in Oakland and I work with Greenbelt Alliance. And I just wanted to thank everyone in public comment for having such incredible fruitful ideas 
it's really inspiring. And so on the basis of that, as I was listening to everyone, I thought it would be very um, useful for the CRNA to possibly create a LinkedIn group for folks who are on this call to be able to connect with each other and further these conversations and the effort of transparency. And I know LinkedIn is not a tool that is available to everyone, but if the CRNA can't create a tool like that, I'm happy to create a LinkedIn group because I am uh, would, would really like to keep on connecting with the folks speaking on here since we're all trying to um, accomplish the same goal. So if you could let me know if that's possible, I'm actually happy to do it myself. I really wanna keep the conversations going and build more partnerships on the ground informally as well. Sorry, I'm having trouble with, with my mute unmute button. Thanks, Berna. Our next speaker is Sarah Rascone. So Sarah, go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Rascone. I'm calling on behalf of the Mountains Recreation Conservation Authority. We're a local public agency who serve the LA and Ventura areas. And significant elements of equity for our agency include the development and public access to local parks that are within walking distance for all of Californians and with an emphasis on SDAC and DAC communities, but also nurturing community access to regional natural lands, resources, and areas that go beyond national and state parks. So also including regional parks and state conservancy lands, especially our mountains, coastline, and beaches, and providing equitable access to all communities, especially underserved communities, to these natural resources. And especially considering the nexus to these natural resources and our parks where we can work with CNRA to go beyond multi-benefit, the, um, the existing definition of multi-benefit and really make our parks work for our communities and be cooling centers uh, especially during periods of extreme heat like we're facing right now in Los Angeles, and also providing that respite and helping close the gap to the coast for our communities in inland LA. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your comment. So again, if there is anyone else who would like to provide public input for 90 seconds uh, impromptu, please feel free to raise your hand. I see we have one person left on the phone. So if our phone caller would like to provide input, please um, press star nine. So we'll just give a little bit of time for any, any last speakers who would like to provide their input. We really appreciate you all hanging out till the bitter end, listening to all of the comments. It looks like we have no more up. Oh, we have one more speaker. Thank you, uh, Vic Vong. Please go ahead and unmute yourself and provide your comment. Hi, um, can y'all hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Vic Vong. I'm a fellow with the Green Lighting Institute on the and climate equity team. Um, thank you for today's session. And um, I would also double tap on the need for a land acknowledgement. Um, and uh, first of all, thank you for convening this panel. Um, and there are a lot of amazing insights that were shared um, and also for this time for public comment. I would actually share um, for anyone who wants to connect since there are so many amazing advocates and representatives today, if you want uh, me to connect y'all together, uh, my Twitter is at sign Vong Vic, V-O-N-G-V-I-C. Um, but I do think there are a lot of amazing perspectives and perhaps some organizing that could happen um, out of all the concerns that were raised. Um, and I think in particular, one thing I would raise is in, uh, in considering nature-based solutions um, that are kind of gaining ground um, in consideration for, you know, a way to advance climate solutions, um, keeping in mind of meeting communities where they're at and where nature-based solutions may be the answer and also need equity analyses, but also making sure in uh, CNRA's other sessions that there's still equity at the table and represented. Um, so it's not kind of like a solid approach, but it is embedded into the technical analyses and criteria for um, what is pushed forward as well. Um, so I want to thank everyone. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's B-O-N-G-B-I-C. Uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you, Vic, for your comment. Uh, it looks like a, a, at least one other person is inspired. So uh, Isabel Kay, 
please go ahead and unmute yourself and provide your comment. Um, thank you very much. Um, I work in um, San Diego um, on Kumeyaay land, and I manage four reserves for the University of California Natural Reserve System. Among them, um, two coastal reserves, one in Mission Bay and one on the outer coast in La Jolla. And I do um, very much appreciate um, the work of the MPA Collaborative, um, which is um, supporting the Department of Fish and Wildlife in um, protecting these areas and, and monitoring them. But I do think we need to really acknowledge that um, the huge crush of humanity at the coast it is possibly going to um, you know, threaten those habitats, especially with sea level rise um, in invading, you know, the sea level covering the rocky intertidal areas forever. So I do think um, we really need to figure out how to um, give equitable access while also preserving those resources for the long term. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel. So one last opportunity for anyone who would like to provide input this evening. All right, well, with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone for your participation, for your great comments, for listening to the panel and the commenters. Uh, we wanna let you know that there will be a meeting summary that will be prepared that will include the input that you all provided today. It will be posted on the CNRA project website and shared with you all. Also, in a few days, you'll receive a post-meeting survey that will allow you to provide feedback on the workshop. So we really would uh, appreciate that feedback. Um, finally, again, if you have additional comment, you can provide that via email, regular mail, or voicemail. Um, one more thing to note, as was mentioned at the beginning of the workshop, there will be a biodiversity workshop coming up in July, on July 27th. Uh, you can register for that on the website. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Amanda and Jen for any final comments. Well, I guess I'll just start and then hand off to Jen by just thanking our panel and thanking all of the public who took time to be here this evening and weigh in on the questions that we identified um, and provide other insights and recommendations. Very, very grateful um, and excited to move this conversation forward and uh, see it move through implementation as part of the, the process. Jen? Thanks, Amanda. I too want to express my appreciation for this incredible conversation. This was just really valuable. I appreciate the folks that stayed through the end, especially the panel. Um, I want to give a shout out to Guillermo for leading the dialogue in a really artful way. He really drew out some important thoughts um, and you all did so in such a, a warm and welcoming way that it really, I think, engaged the audience. So I'm, I'm just very pleased with how this turned out. Um, I love the idea of people continuing to communicate with each other. I am not tech savvy. I am on LinkedIn, but I don't understand how to use it. But if you guys want to keep talking, I think that's wonderful. Um, but uh, I will I'll reassure you that uh, Amanda and I are very committed to in, you know, having equity be part of the conversation moving forward. Um, this was not intended to be a one off, but a table setting for the future. So I hope you see that in our future panels as well. So. Thank you all for being here. This was really meaningful and a, a great night. So appreciate your time. And thanks to the translators. You guys did an amazing job as well. And facilitators. Sorry, everybody did great. <laughs> thanks, Debbie. <laughs>